We are starting a brand new Christmas series this morning. Uh, if you've seen that on some of the social media, we've put that out there. And just to let you all know that, that we were beginning this today. And I'm so excited about this series called Upside Down Christmas. And the reason that I'm calling it that is because we're going to be looking into Matthew's account of Jesus' birth over the next few weeks here as we lead up to Christmas. And it's pretty incredible. And Matthew's account, if you've read it, it's and you understand what he's saying, and, and we're going to go through a lot of this, so you will after these next few weeks at least if you don't already, it's by all accounts pretty messy. There's a lot of messiness uh, in his account of Jesus all the way up to his birth, and we're going to see that he doesn't make any effort to hide these painful things from the Christmas story, which is, again, one of the reasons I love the Bible so much. It doesn't hide anything. It tells you the truth. It just lays it out there. And so in the process... He turns many of our expectations about God and about Jesus and about Christmas totally upside down. Now, the end result, hopefully, is going to be that that's a good thing. And we'll see kind of what I mean by that here in just a few minutes. This morning, we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and get there with me or pull out your iPads, your iPhones, whatever it is, your Androids, whatever you uh, have. And and get Matthew chapter 1 pulled up. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 17. Now, this is going to be a lot of names this morning. Uh, and so, as we read through this, I don't want you to be like, is he reading the wrong scripture? Why, why are we reading through all these names? I'm about to explain to you why we're reading all these names here in just a minute. But let's read through it together. Matthew chapter 1. These are verses 1 through 17. It says, This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Abinadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jeroam. And Jerome, the father of Uzzah. Uzzah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Yes, Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shetil. Shetil, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abahud. Abahud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Nathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to, to the Messiah. Now, a little bit of honesty here. How many of you zoned out while I was, was reading that? Okay. We had, okay. I see the honest people. Aaron, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you, brother. I see that hand. <laughs> and online, I'm sure there's some of y'all are like, dude, I don't know. I was drinking my coffee. I, yeah. Man, the whole sound booth is raising their hand. You guys got to be paying attention. You're supposed to be paying attention to this. Here's the reality. If, even if you're here this morning, you're like, no, I was listening to all of that. How about a little bit more honesty? How about when you're on your own and you're reading through the Bible and you come to something like this, a passage like this, you come to a genealogy or a list of a bunch of names. How many of you either skim it or have skipped it altogether? Raise your hand. Okay, that's more like it, right? Most of us are kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to say it. I think we've all done it, right? We, we do it because the truth is it's, it's, it's just not a whole lot of fun reading it, right? It's kind of boring. You read through that, and there's a whole lot of names, as you could tell. Some of them are very hard to, to pronounce, and so we're kind of like, why am I even reading this? We just kind of skim through it. And this is kind of why I think it should maybe bring a question to our mind. So why in the world would Matthew start off his gospel 
with this genealogy. I mean, if you know anything about writing or if you read books or even if you watch a movie, most of the time at the very beginning, and that's the hook, that you want it to be something that draws everybody in. You want people to pay attention. You want them to go, I need to see where this is going or wow, I'm interested. You know, some, I hear people say, now I'm invested, right? I'm invested into this, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to see this through. But Matthew doesn't do that. But there's a reason that he does list this genealogy, because in this genealogy is everything we need to know about Christianity. All the essentials are here. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that, because if I studied this these past few weeks, I mean, I've learned so much as I've dived into commentaries and, and watched other pastors preach and teach on this. I mean, you start really investing into something like this, and it is amazing to me the things you can learn. I mean, some of these things I knew, some of these things I didn't know, some of these things it made my mind connect this to that, to this, to that. And I'm telling you, there is so much to learn here just through the, this one passage that we read this morning that typically, and I'm putting myself in there, a lot of times we would come to and just kind of skim through and move on. And I've also, I just realized that while there's a whole bunch of it, we only have time. Literally, you think, well, Darren, how are you going to preach a whole sermon on this? The truth is, we only got time for four things this morning. There's more than that. And I would encourage you to go back, read through it, investigate it yourself. But there's a whole lot there. So we're going to cover four things this morning that we can learn from this genealogy. And I think there's some things in here that are going to really cause us uh, just to go deeper in our walk with God, to see this in a different light, hopefully challenge us to think a little differently um, when it comes to Christmas. So the first one I'm going to borrow from Tim Keller, at least the first uh, point, which is the gospel is not good advice, it's good news. The gospel is not good advice, it's good news. Most stories in our fairy tales, maybe even stories you told your children, my kids when they were little, they always liked me to make up stories. And you can imagine with my imagination, they got a little crazy sometimes. And there were moments where Jen's eyes would get big and her eyebrows would go up and I'd realize, okay, yeah, I need to change the direction of this story. Maybe I need to go a little bit. It's supposed to help them fall asleep, not scare them to death. So, you know, we, but we normally start those stories out. A lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll say uh, things like, you know, once upon a time, and then we go into it. Or for us, you know, Star Wars people, you know, in a galaxy far, far away. Right? We, we, we like that little intro, like, oh, here we go. It's setting this thing up. But Matthew doesn't start that way. He starts with a genealogy. But what I want you to understand is this is his way of saying what I'm about to tell you about actually happened in time and space. See, and I've mentioned this before as we read through Scripture, is this is not made up. This is what Matthew was trying to get at. When you are trying to make up a story, when you're trying to lie especially, you don't give a lot of details. You give broad statements because you don't want them to be able to hold your feet to the fire. You don't want them to say, but you said this, this, and this about this time, this day, this thing, this person, whatever. And so you try to just kind of be real broad. But when you're telling something that is truth, what do we do? When someone, we're trying to get somebody to believe us, we give them as many details as we possibly can. We said, no, listen, you can, believe me, there was this and this, and, and they had this on, and they had this on, and this person was there. You can call them, you can ask them, this was, and you just give detail after detail after detail because you're trying to prove this happened. This is real. This is not a story. This is not a once upon a time type of story. This is fact. And what's really important is that Christianity's most important feature is that it is actual history. Because the core of Christianity is not a set of principles that Jesus taught to us. It was something Jesus was going to do for us and did for us. See, most religions, if you think about this, most religions, when you start peeling back the layers of those religions and what they believe and what they say and all their nice little things, you know, I don't know if you've seen this, but through the years I've seen commercials and I'm like, this is a really great commercial. And then it'll have some other religion that has put that commercial on. But it's like, but everything they said, I agree with. I mean, that's, that was some really good stuff. See, a lot of the other religions, they're built on teachings and principles that really would be true whether their religious founder ever lived or not. There's a lot of really good things, a lot of really moral sayings that you can look at and go, oh, that's really cool. The religious founder was just the, a mouthpiece for those teachings. That's all they were. But that's not true with Christianity. This is where it gets so much different. Christianity depends on a set of events 
that actually took place in time and history because the core of Christianity, again, is not what Jesus taught us to do, but what he did for us. This is why the gospel is not primarily good advice, it's good news. If Jesus didn't happen, and this is why you know, a lot of people want to debate Christianity and all these things, and I tell them, listen, if you, if you really want to do its service, then prove Jesus didn't exist. Go, go there, because we're claiming it. We're claiming detail. We're, cla- we're not just, because if Jesus didn't exist, you can work this whole thing. It doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. And we, we've said this before, you, you can go there, and you, but you can't say things like, oh, he was just a good person. Good people don't claim to be God. That'd be a crazy person. So he's either a lunatic, or he's a liar, or he is the, the, the savior of the world, but you've got to choose what you believe there. And so when we go into Christianity, when we dive into this, we realize, oh, no, it is all set up on the person and work of Jesus Christ. For instance, when Jesus was born, right, because we know the word gospel, that it's actually an announcement, it means good news. And when Jesus was born, we know from the story that the angels showed up, right, and they're announcing peace on earth, salvation for men. Jesus became that for us by entering into history and doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. You know, Casey already alluded to that even through our time of communion. So the gospel is not primarily good advice. It is good news. The second point is this, that we pull from this, is Jesus' genealogy shows us that God is in control. And I don't think there's ever been a year that we've needed to know that more or bank on that more or believe in that more than this year, that God is in control. Matthew takes what the world would have considered to be this insignificant family line, and he organizes all of human history around it. Here's why it's important. Because at this point, it certainly did not seem like in history that Jesus was the focal point of history. You can't, you've got to remember, we have to go back in time where this was written, the time when this was happening, the time when Jesus was being born. Israel was a small Middle Eastern country that was under the rule of somebody else. Now, nobody in Rome was paying attention to this family line at this point, right? They're they're not real invested in this at this point. But God had made a promise to Abraham to bring salvation to the world through Jesus. And at this point in world history, you've got these really powerful nations and, and, and these people that seem like they are the ones directing things. The Romans were extremely powerful. They had taken over so much of the world, and they had all the backing, all the money, all the, the, the war equipment. I mean, they, they were able to just take people out all the time. And that just seemed like who was in control and, and who was taking over the world. But Matthew shows us in this genealogy, what he shows us is that God is the one guiding it all according to his plans for the Messiah. See, the, the powers of the world are an illusion. Let me give you an example of that. One of the details that most of us know about Christmas, and we probably read this story to our kids at Christmas, at least I encourage you to do that. We always read this to our kids before they would ever open the presents, and we would say, let's read the, you know, the story of Jesus' birth, let's read the Christmas story, make sure we understand this is what's most important. Um, when our kids were little, we'd only buy them you know, three presents. We'd say, listen, Jesus only got three, You're only getting, you don't need any more than three. And we really tried to tie it in, Serious, in all seriousness, we weren't being cheap. We were trying to say, listen, let's, let's connect this as much as we can Uh, to what it really stands for, what it's really all about. And so we would read this story, and most of us have done this, so we understand we then read the story of of Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem. And they had to travel to Bethlehem because Rome, right, had to impose all these, these taxes for everyone, and so they had to go to their home city to be registered. But Luke, in his gospel, he explains to us that God's purpose in that was so that one of the prophecies about the Messiah would be fulfilled, that the one that, that, would, that they talked about would be born in Bethlehem. So God moves Rome to do this tax so he can get Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem. And when you think about that, you wonder why God would go to all that trouble. I believe it was to demonstrate to us that God can move powerful nations around like chess pieces if he wants to, to accomplish his purposes. He taxed the whole world to move two people 90 miles. That's pretty incredible. That's the power of our God. Here's why that should encourage you and and should encourage me. Because it it doesn't look like now, I don't know if you've paid attention, like Jesus is in control of our world. It's pretty crazy right now. I mean, everywhere you look, it just seems like chaos, right? 
well, the news is not going to be here this morning. I don't know if you know that, but none of them are going to be showing up with all of their cameras, paying attention to what we're doing here. No, the, the mainstream news is watching what they think are the most important powers in the world, right? They're watching the, the market. They're watching the White House. They're watching the world politics. But those things are truly insignificant in the grand scheme of life. See, but we buy into the other so much because that's what we see so often. And we put, that's why we tend to kind of start putting our hope and our faith and our trust in things of this world. And then all of a sudden we get, I don't know why I'm so upset. And so, so because you should be, if that's where your hope, faith, and trust is put in, and that's what you believe in, and that's what gives you your joy and your happiness and your peace, good luck because it's going to be crazy forever because it's not God. God's the only thing that's consistent, unshaken, unfallible. See, what really matters is what God is doing in the kingdom of Jesus. And he still moves around the most powerful nations at will to accomplish his purposes. See, there's an unseen story behind the story. Many of the Israelites during this time when our scripture was written, they were discouraged. They were very discouraged. They looked around. They didn't see how God was fulfilling his promises. I mean, again, Rome's in charge. They were not nice they were coming in and just taking things from people. They, they were killing people. They were killing babies. They were, they were doing so many awful, horrible things, unjust things. We think our world is crazy now. Um, their day was even, it was, it was a lot rougher than what we're even dealing with at times. And many of us, we look around right now, we are so discouraged. And we see unbelief growing and secularism, is, it seems to just kind of be taking over. And there's so much corruption. And I don't know of another time in history where there was so much arguing going on than there is right now. And all of it just seems to be destroying our nation. And so there's a lot of unrest right now, especially in America. But I would say to you this morning, don't be deceived. It didn't look back then like God was accomplishing his purposes either, but he was. He was doing his greatest work. And the same thing is true in our life. You know, we, we might be discouraged because it may look like um, we are subject to forces that we can't control. But we cannot forget God has an infallible purpose and plan for our lives and for this world. That's something that should bring us joy. And, it, and that the, the purpose is, that, is to reveal Jesus to us and to glorify himself in us. And that brings me to this third point. Third point is this. God is working in all things, good and bad, for his purposes. When you look closely at, the, at Jesus' genealogy, man, there is some messy, random, upside-down, chaotic stuff in there. Okay, If you look back in your scripture there at verse 3 again, you'll see where it says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now, first of all, you, you know, scholars would, and anyone that reads the Bible a lot, that thinks through a lot of things would ask, why in the world did he include the mother's name there? See, because they never included women's names in Jewish genealogies. They just didn't. And he put that in there for one reason. That was to call to mind the story behind it. He knew that there would be a day when the people would read this, we would read this, and he wanted us not to forget this story. Now, I don't know if you know the story or not. I'm going to give you a brief and hopefully G to PG 13 version of this story, but it's found in Genesis 38. Tamar was the wife of one of Judah's sons, but her husband actually died before they were able to have kids. And in those days, if a guy dies and he leaves his wife without kids, it's the obligation of the deceased brother, the brothers of the deceased to marry her and to give her children. And so it was really important that your brothers married nice-looking ladies just for insurance, right? It's kind of like, hey, man, don't you do that because if you ever pass for I, that ain't going to be good. Don't, man, no, come on. I'm just kidding. That, maybe that happened. Maybe a few times they were kind of like, bro, please stay alive. Whatever you do, stay alive. Um, anyway, some of y'all that have sisters-in-laws, don't you elbow anybody at this moment in time. But you'd be like, oh, Lord, I'm glad that's still not in play. But it was in play then, and it did happen. And so the brother's name was Onan, and he didn't like Tamar. He didn't care for her really at all, but he doesn't, and so he ends up, he doesn't want to have kids with her. 
but he takes her as his wife. And when they, I'm trying, I promise this is G-rated. When, when they came together, when they came together, Onan made sure that he didn't quite seal the deal with her. All right? That's one of the best ways I can say it. As a matter of fact, the KJV puts it very, very, very delicately, or as delicately as you can, and it says, he spilled it on the ground so that he wouldn't give seed to his brother. Okay? That's the way the Bible puts it. Well, God doesn't like that at all. He's not pleased with this at all. And so he actually kills Onan. Now Judah is two sons down and he's only got three. So he's only got one son left. Well, legally speaking, Tamar was supposed to be given to Judah's third son, Shelah. But at this point, Judah is feeling like, nah, this girl is cursed. You know, she's been married to my sons. They both died. There's something up, you know, and, and he, he's not doesn't really like her at all either. And he doesn't want to lose his last son, so he just kind of stalls. For years, <laughs> he stalls. And Tamar kind of figures out what's happening here, that Judah is never going to let her marry the third son. And so she devises a plan. And it turns out that Judah, her father-in-law, has a weakness for prostitutes. And so she dresses up like a prostitute. She seduces him, and she gets pregnant with Perez and Zerah. And a few months go by, and as normal, she begins to show that she is pregnant. And Judah, her father-in-law, sees this, has no idea that these are his babies. He orders that she be stoned, because obviously she's been sleeping around. And so, yeah, so they drag her out. And she says this, though, before they stone her, she says, I have the belt of the man whose babies these are. And it was Judah's belt. Back then, you're, if you had that, that was like having the guy's wallet. That was like saying, listen, I can tell you whose babies these are. And it was like proof of who she had been with. So now we're in a very awkward situation. This sounds more like a Jerry Springer show than the Bible right now. I get it. All right? You're kind of like, what? And you're probably like, I feel a lot better about my family now. Like, you know, we're, we're not near as weird or as crazy. I thought we were nuts, but this is really crazy, right? I mean, so this is, this is just truth. The Bible doesn't hide anything. You should read it more. You're like, man, that's pretty interesting. I should read the Bible. This is stuff that really, really happened. There's some messy, chaotic stuff. And yet in all of this, all this is going on. God is working and bringing about a perfect plan. Now, some of you have some messy dysfunction in your life. I have some in mine. But God has one overriding purpose for our lives, which is to accomplish Jesus' purpose purposes in and through us. So I want to give you a remarkable observation here about this genealogy that I believe further makes this point. And when I came across this, when I was studying it, man, I, I tell you, I got goosebumps. You know, I, I read this stuff and I'm just like, man, that's so amazing. God is so amazing. You know, skeptics will often point out, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but that the genealogy that we read today in Matthew is different than the one that we read in the book of Luke. But most scholars um, answer this pretty easily with the fact that the genealogy given in Matthew is through Joseph and Jesus' adopted father. And the one in Luke traces Jesus' line through Mary. Even though it says his father, meaning his, they believe, I think it's Heli, is his father-in-law. So, so you have two different genealogies here. And see, the reason this all matters is God told David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God told David that a blood descendant of his would sit on the throne forever. That's a promise from God. That is a promise from God. And so I, want, I have a picture for you. I have a visual picture for you that it helps me anyway when I see these kind of things. So here's, here's a picture. You have David, and what the, the red line is, is the blood line. Okay? The orange line is representing uh, the kingly line, right? the throne. So you have the throne line and you have the blood line of how this is all playing out, this promise that God has made to David that there would be one that would sit on the throne forever, a blood descendant. Well, the kingly line then is passed down to Solomon, David's son, because in those days the kingly line was passed from father to son. But one of Solomon's descendants Jeconiah, that we read about earlier, he sinned so badly that God said in Jeremiah 22 that none of his descendants would ever sit on the throne again. So now we have a dilemma, right? And when you look at this, it's like all of a sudden the bloodline stops. Now, obviously, the, the throne line continues, 
but wait a minute, didn't God just make a promise that said there would be one that would come from the bloodline that would sit on the throne forever? This, God's breaking a promise. Oh my goodness, we have an issue here. We have a major dilemma. Because now we don't have a bloodline to Jesus. We don't have a blood, blood descendant of David's who would sit on the throne forever as promised by God to David. Well, this is where Luke's genealogy enters in. And when you look at this next picture, Luke makes it clear that Mary, Jesus' mother, was a physical descendant of David through another son of David named Nathan. So get this. Joseph was a descendant of Solomon, which means Jesus got the legal right to the throne through him. But because Jesus was adopted, he avoided the blood curse. In other words, the virgin birth of Jesus was the only way both prophecies could be true. Jesus was an actual descendant of Mary, who was a blood descendant of David, which means God fulfilled his word to David that a blood descendant of his would sit on the throne forever. Now, who but God could come up with something like that? That's our God. He's in control. Amen? Amen. That, that should bring you some encouragement. When you look at that, you're like, the rest of the world would have looked at that, and even some people today look at that and go, oh, yeah, I don't know about all of this. And then you see what's really happened here, and you go, that's my God. My God's in control, even in the craziest of circumstances. Even when it seems like, oh, it's all been blown up. It's not going to work anymore. What he said he was going to do is not going to happen. And we don't, this is where the Bible's so clear about God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We can't wrap our mind around, and thank God we can't wrap, wrap our mind around how big he is, how amazing he is, what he's capable of. And so this is one of those moments in history that we look at and we go, man, my God is so awesome. He is in so much control. See, for a Jewish person, their genealogy, man, this was their resume. Your heritage was how you showed the world your worth. It was a big deal. Some of you are thinking about your genealogy and going, I'm glad that changed too, right? You're kind of like, there's some people, some crazy ones back there. But this is what was happening even in their day. So back then, just like today, you know, with resumes, and I'm not calling anybody out here, but sometimes those resumes can be fudged a little bit, right? We make them maybe sound a little bit better, use some titles maybe that wasn't really the title, it makes it sound nice, and we kind of fudge them a little bit to make us look as good as we can possibly look to whoever it is we're presenting it to. We only include the best parts. We, we omit the nasty details. You don't put people's names on your resume for them to call <laughs> that you know you didn't maybe get along with so well at that last job because you know that's not going to represent you well. So kings like Herod would do the same thing. They would only list people in their genealogy who established their worth. Yet look who Jesus includes in his. Tamar, which we already went there. Rahab, she was a prostitute and a Gentile that God saved from Jericho. Ruth, she was a Moabite. And by the way, I don't know if you're paying attention that in reading and seeing all of these women. Women were not considered important in these days. So the last thing you'd want to do is list women out in, in this day. Yes, but you look at Jesus and you go, wow, they're included in his genealogy, which is another beautiful thing. And by the way, these are not even respectable women. Every woman listed in here was involved in some, some sexual scandal. Verse 6, it says, David and the wife of Uriah. Why that phrase? Why didn't Matthew just write her name out? Because once again, Matthew is making sure that we remember the story. Most of you know that story. I don't have time to retell that whole story. But basically, David betrayed one of his best friends. He slept with his wife, and then he had him killed to try and cover it all up. It was a horrible moral failure. Why would you list that out in your genealogy? Jesus' line is filled with moral outsiders, ethnic outsiders with Gentiles, and even at this day and age, gender outsiders with the women that were listed. Now, this is all supposed to be sending you and I a message, and hopefully we're picking up on this message. This brings me to my fourth point, and that is that Jesus came for the outcast. Our Savior is a Savior for everyone. No matter who you are or what you have done, there is room in his family for you. And you may feel like you're an outcast. You may be one of those people who's like, man, I feel worthless but I want you to know he has purchased you with the universe's most valuable possession, and that is his blood. Man, Casey did such a great job earlier 
It's describing that to us. You may think God's plans for you are over, but I want you to know this genealogy shows you they have just begun. God was at work in the darkest of situations, bringing forth the light of the world, his son. And in Christ, he takes this ugliness of our life and he redeems it for the beauty of his glory. See, what's so great about God is you don't have to earn God's love. It's given to you as a gift. It's purchased by him. And when you embrace that, you find rest. And I don't know, again, of a year where we needed more of a present for Christmas 2020 than rest. The ability to rest because we know who is in control. So next time that you think of that baby in a manger, or you look at a nativity scene, I want you to just remember how many upside down things happened just for him to be born. Remember how far God went for you and for me so that we could have a savior. He knew we needed to be rescued. He knew if it was up to us, we see what we do when we're in charge. It's failure after failure after ugly failure. And he said, I have to save them. And so our holy God comes down to this sinful place to save you and I. We needed a savior. That baby in a manger was and is the pathway for us to become children of God. This is why Christians get so excited and happy about Christmas. Because we realize what that baby represents. Now, I get that our world has beautified it and made it look so pretty and, and they make the mangers look so pretty and perfect and Jesus all wrapped up so perfect and Joseph and Mary and some of these pictures are just so perfect and all the, the shepherds and animals and all these things and all oh, the angels and it's just, they beautify. And it's not that it wasn't a beautiful moment. It, it, as far as spiritually speaking, it was a very beautiful moment. Man, this was a very crazy upside down Christmas and birth and genealogy about how God was bringing this all to pass. But he did this because he had us on his mind. And he said, listen, I'm going to make a pathway for you to become my children. We need to understand this happened in Jesus coming, the whole Christmas story. This is not a way. Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life. So when don't get caught up in, yeah, we celebrate Christmas, but some of my other friends, they celebrate this and this, and they're probably going to end up in heaven as well. If it, it's only through Jesus. He never said that I am a way. He said, I am the way. So when we, when we celebrate Christmas, you need to understand how important that baby is. Without that baby who grows up to die on that cross, who then walks out of that tomb three days later, you and I are going to hell without him. So Christmas is, brings so much joy in knowing the truth. And when you read John 1, 12, where it says, yet to all who, dis, who, who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the gift of Jesus. That's the gift that that baby represents, that Jesus represents, coming to earth, doing something he did not have to do so you and I could be saved. That's why when Christ, when Christ followers look at, at, at a, a manger scene, that's why when we look at this, we think about Christmas and you get away from Santa, and you get away from all the present stuff and all the commercializing of it, and you start thinking about how it started and where it started from, you go, this is special. This is an amazing moment. You know, I think it's, it's something to think about that, you know, Jesus never tells us, remember my birth, right? We do an incredible job as a, well, we do an incredible job of celebrating Christmas. I don't know we always do an incredible job of remembering the birth as far as what it represents, but Jesus never even said, you need to remember my birth. What he told us to remember was his death, right? He told us, you, do, you know, do this in remembrance of me. That's why we take communion every week. We don't want one Sunday to go by where we forget what Jesus did for us, his love for us. But the beautiful part is, is that we can then backtrack and go to Christmas and go, but this is where it started. And this is the day in which, and, and I don't want to ruin anybody's you know, fun, but more than likely Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. I, hopefully that didn't just like blow your theology out the water, but that's the day we celebrate it, so that's fine. So if we're going to celebrate it, let's celebrate it properly. 
Let's remember what it's really about. Let's stay focused this year. Let's think about this genealogy. Let's think about all that was happening and all the moments that seemed chaotic and out of line and crazy. And everyone was, at that point, was probably panicking. You can even read back through scripture and you can see the moments when Jesus dies and you know, they all take off as close as friends, as disciples. They're freaking out. Oh, this is going wrong. This isn't what's supposed to happen. He's supposed to come here. He wasn't supposed to die, even though he told them that. They didn't listen real well. You know, they, this isn't supposed to happen. Now what's going to happen? The one we're following is gone and they're freaking out and they think that Jesus should have come and established his throne and he was going to rule the world. Right? They had it all messed up. That wasn't God's intentions. He had a plan. It just wasn't maybe exactly what we thought it was. We have the advantage of reading it through now and going, okay, now I get it. I see what he was doing. And that should make it mean even more to us that we look back and go, and he did all of that for me. Wow. He would have done all of that even if it was just me that needed to be saved. That's how much God loves us. That's why we worship him. That's why we take time to come to church and lift our voices and sing to him in worship. That's why we live our lives the way that we live them, because we want to honor him and lift him up. That's why we tell other people about who he is, because we realize the severity of this whole thing, that this, this is a perfect opportunity, by the way. It's a side note. Christmas is a great opportunity to bring up subjects like this of saying, but do you know the story? You know, do you, do you know the real story? Not just, oh yeah, Jesus was born, but do you know Jesus? And man, to tell them the, the, the gospel message so they can be saved. And if we love people, that's the present we'll give them this year if they don't know. So I want to encourage you to find comfort in this this morning. Find comfort that God's in control of everything. If your life right now seems out of control, if you would say right now, I'm not a child of God, man, that's got to feel scary. Because when you die, it's not going to be good if you don't know Jesus. That's truth. And so I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to change that. You're going to have an opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus. I do believe. I do want to do what, what they said in John. I, I want to become a, a child of God. And so I'm going to tell you exactly how you can do that after I pray and we have our invitation. Let's, let's pray first, though. God, when we read through this scripture, when we read through genealogies, first of all, God, I apologize up front just admitting that there's times where I would read through these things and skip past these things and, and not really pay attention to what's going on or put in the, the due diligence to, to realize why it's all listed out. Lord, it's, it's to me, it's just even more incredible that you list out so many names in the Bible that just that alone should make me realize names, names matter to you. <laughs> My name matters to you. Every person in sitting in this worship center and watching online, their name matters to you. You know their name. You, you, God, you created them. You have a plan for their life. And you've done all of this throughout history so they could be saved. So Lord, I pray that this Christmas season would be different for those that are maybe watching online or are here today that don't know you. And that would change for them right now in this very moment that they would believe in you. They would place all of their hope and trust and belief in Jesus. I pray it all in his name. Amen. Amen.